Hi, folks. Welcome back to the PagerDuty streaming channels, wherever you're joining us from. I am Mandy Walls, DevOps Advocate here at PagerDuty. We're here on the How To Happy Hour. It's Friday. It's time to chill out, learn some stuff. Um, I have a guest with me today. We're going to talk to him in a minute. Um, if you have any other questions or things that you would like to hear or see from us, you can always get in touch with us. We're community-team at pagerduty.com. And we found Ben on the forums, and we'd love to see you there, too. We're at community.pagerduty.com, uh, where you can ask questions and uh, learn stuff about PagerDuty. Um, you can also subscribe to our podcast. We're at pagertothelimit.com, and we'd love to have you there. Coming up on the channel uh, next week, Dormain had to uh, reschedule with Jonathan Rendy, but they will be talking retail store operations on Monday. And I believe she still has uh, Brian uh, meeting with her later. Uh, Jose Antonio will be back on Wednesday for Terraform time, and we'll be back here next Friday for a how-to happy hour. But now I'm going to turn us over to Ben, as Ben has an amazing project to share with us today. Uh, this is so neat, and I'm so glad that he decided to, to, to join us. So Ben, take it away. Tell us a bit about yourself, uh, what you do, and, and why, why you wanted some laundry duty. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mandy. I'm really happy to be on here. I was doing a personal project that um, is not at all related to what I do professionally. I do video conferencing normally, but I had a hobby project where I thought, I wonder if I can make my life a little easier and avoid some annoyances uh, and problems. And it ended up being a big learning experience. And part of it involved pager duty. Most of the Challenges were not actually around pager duty and were around a bunch of other stuff, but uh, it did involve a pager duty API client that I wrote, and I would love to share with that uh, share that with you and show you what I figured out because um, there's a lot to figure out. Awesome. Um, so I I have a laundry machine and dryer in the garage and. It makes it a little hard to hear when they're done because any beeping that they do is behind a closed door that is kind of thick and it's not really audible, especially if you have any sort of music or headphones on or anything. And if you if it takes a little bit longer than you set a timer for, then your timer might be too short. You go out and it's still running. And you say, okay, well, now, now I have a second opportunity to forget to set a timer. <laughs> yes. And I'm just not going to remember or I... I just dismiss the timer because I'm like kind of distracted. And then now I'm just not going to go out there until I remember like an hour from now. And um, I thought, well, is there some way that I can like have this thing just repeatedly remind me if I forget about it, where if I don't actually go and open it, it's going to say, okay, 10 minutes later, I'm going to come back and remind you a second time and maybe use a more like noticeable method than just a push, then like a timer beeping, just maybe a push notification, something that I have to actively dismiss and it knows whether I've dismissed it or not and whether I've actually like succeeded in, in, in opening this thing up. So if you have a laundry machine inside of your house, like where there's just audio you can hear, um, a parent's house is like that, that's easier. But if it's outside, if, if it's in the garage, it's not as easy. If it's in a separate building, I don't really have a way to, to deal with that. Um, that was what we faced in college. And that was, uh, there's really nothing we could do there. Um, we didn't have any good like Wi-Fi. We couldn't, yeah. it, it, they weren't our machines. They belonged to the university. They did not have any power outlets we could make use of. Like we couldn't take the machines apart. They didn't belong to us. Um, for that one, I just wrote a fake front end for April Fool's Day and fooled everyone with their laundry bonding <laughs> solution there. Um, that got them good. but. After all that, now I had this this place here with a real washroom dryer that belonged to us. I said, okay, I can now take that silly April Fool's approach of faking all the data and maybe actually use real data, use real instrumentation. I have power, power outlets there I can use. I have my own Wi-Fi. I can open up the machines if I want to. They don't belong to somebody else. If I break them, I can either fix them or replace it myself. It's not like a university problem. So how, what can I do? to figure out if these things are done or not. What kind of sensors can I use and how can I get the message to me and my roommates? Um, 
So I wanted to figure out how to, the, the first challenge was how do you instrument these things to figure out if they're running. Um, it turned out to be much easier for the washing machine than for the dryer, and they use two different techniques. Um, for the washing machine, I'm using an off-the-shelf uh, smart power outlet. So this is okay. yeah. this is from Casa, the TP-Link brand, and they're like fifteen dollars, and they they're just a one ten outlet, and they can the the most basic ones you can just turn on and off uh, from an Android app or an iOS app, and you can control them that way. You can get um, those at like a big box store. They're pretty readily available. Yeah, I think I just got mine from like Amazon and Target. They're they're everywhere. You can get them at Best Buy. Um, I don't know what the availability is internationally, but in the U.S., those are just off the shelf. You can get them in a four pack if you want to get them really cheap. Um, I think if you just want the the cheapest option possible, they're like six dollars a piece if yeah. you get a four pack. So I just got those. I use it to like keep my phone charged not above 80 percent so the battery is like in a better health there um if you want a slightly more fancy one you can get the ones that have energy monitoring which is what i needed here so they can tell you how many watts are being used at any given time what's oh. the amperage what's the voltage and they can just monitor that and you can pull it so if you look in your android app it'll tell you okay in the past 24 hours whatever device has been plugged into this thing has used this many watts and it'll it'll tell you that um and you can use that to like turn stuff off that might be a power hog and uh, maybe save some some energy there, save some money. Um, that was what was really useful here because the technique for the for the washing machine was figure out how many milliwatts it's using and use that to determine what state it's in. Um, we ended up with three states active when it's doing the laundry. Completed, which is when it's just finished, but you haven't opened it yet. So it's still showing the green, please open me light. Mm. And that's my turn. It's when that happens, that's my job to go outside and deal with it. And then the third state is once I've opened it up, the light turns off and uh, then it's idle and it's using the, the least amount of power. So just trying to categorize all the different milliwatt levels into uh, those three states and then send notifications when the state changes between those three states. Um, there's, so the, the smart outlet itself exposes a, um, a, it's not really a, not a web API. It's just a JSON over a raw TCP socket. No. Um, but we can pull that. So the way that's working for me right now is I just have a machine. There's a server is running windows. There's a background service on that machine. That's pulling the, uh, the outlet by making a TCP connection to it every um, 15 seconds, checking what the power level is. And it'll just do, the logic lives in Windows on this one. The logic doesn't live in the, in the smart outlet itself. Um, and the interesting challenges around that one were mostly around talking to the outlet. So that, that JSON over a TCP protocol took a little figuring out. Um, I was definitely standing on the shoulders of giants for that one. Um, and I'll show that. And also, um, the actual figuring out the magic number thresholds for what power levels correspond to which states because there was a little bit of ambiguity there that i had to figure out okay it was um not totally straightforward mostly because the green led does not consume very much power so it's kind of hard to tell if it's on or off because if it's on or off they're both pretty low levels and there's some overlap there but i'm going to show the project that came from that yeah. is here. Um, this is all on GitHub. So you can look at any of this and uh, copy whatever what I've done or fork it for your own use. Um, this is the repo for the laundry machine. Um, so this is for an application, not a library. There are some other uh, repos with libraries and they're more reusable if you just care about talking to the smart outlet and not the laundry machine. But this is for the laundry machine, and uh, it, it's a .NET program, and I have it running in Windows. You can also, if you want to compile it for Linux or Mac OS, that should work fine too. Uh, it works with a couple of different Casa Smart outlets. They have to have energy monitoring though, so mm. not every single model works. I used it with the KP125. Um, and then PagerDuty is also part of this integration. So this program is aware of what PagerDuty is, and it, it talks to it. 
Um, you can install it as a background service so it runs like when Windows starts up in the background. Um, this is what it looks like when you've plugged it in. So it's a bigger view. Um, it's just this little white box. And this is my washing machine in here. Uh, it's always on. Uh, the outlet itself is always on. So yeah. I'm not using the turn on, turn off functionality. It's just always on. It's always this blue light here. And okay. it's just monitoring. That's the only thing it's doing. So if you had a different, if you got a new laundry machine, do new washer, mm -hmm. like all you'd have to do would be to calibrate for what power yes. to drying in those states. Like you don't, that that outlet's independent of of the washing machine yeah. model. Yeah, and the calibration is probably the most time conf time time consuming and confusing part. So yeah. uh, it's the least transferable between machines. I'm not even sure if it would be the same between two different instances of the same model because they're, it's, it could be kind of finicky. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that is, it does require a little bit of staring at spreadsheets for me to figure out, but I'll show the graphs that I made for that to show what the process was for um, how I was able to figure out at least the, the what the state transition should look like. Yeah. And once you know that, it might be a little easier to get the numbers in there. Um, so we start with the hardware part, we're plugging this in. And um, then there's the next part is just some configuration for how do you talk to the outlet. So you can get its IP address. Um, I got it from my router's web page, but you can also use Nmap if you want yeah. to. Um, and I also put a, a DNS uh, host name on it so I could get it more easily and made it static. Um, there are some PagerDuty stuff. This is just a basic um, making a generic integration for Events V2 API. Um, it's it's not like a, a fancy one. It's just the, the normal one. So it's going in here and, and getting the integration key uh, string that you need. There is all the configurations in here. I'll go into more detail on the, these are the two magic numbers for the power thresholds. I'll show that below. The rest of the stuff is just like frequency of polling, um, the PagerDuty key. IP address, um, some error handling like timeouts and retries, um, and then some logging levels. Um, oh, this is a fun one. At one point, the outlet actually got stuck and it was supplying power, but it was not responding on the, the TCP socket. So I think it must have just crashed. It's like a little mini Linux computer in there. I think it must have okay. just had some kind of problem where it wouldn't respond to any, um, any requests. So I added a second thing where if it, if it doesn't respond for however many milliseconds you configure it to, we'll fire a different PagerDuty incident that says, hey, your outlet is like crashed, basically. You should, and at that point, you just have to walk over to it and like pull it out of the wall and plug it back in. Yeah. I don't think there's any way to do it remotely, but um, that's only happened once so far. So uh, hopefully it doesn't happen again. I don't think it's a problem like with like the hardware being like repeatedly uh, reproducible, but um, that did happen once. So I took the opportunity to say, well, if I have a PagerDuty installation, here i may as well just like yeah that's something here. else worth alerting for absolutely yeah i already i have 99 percent of what i need to tell me about this problem so i may as well just like do this extra thing Sweet. um so this was the most complicated part for the laundry machine or for the washing machine was figuring out the power levels um this is the end result but i'll show how i got there um the big thing to the, the big breakthrough for me was when you're going from the complete state, which is the please empty me state to the idle state, which is open and, and done, um, this is a one-way transition and you can't go back from idle to complete. That's what really resolves the, the, the ambiguity of that light being a very low power level. And um, the way I figured that out was I wrote a program that just dumped out all the different values um, for, the, for the milliwatts over an entire run of laundry and I made note of the times when it was starting and stopping different phases. So you start a load and I'll like make a note, this is the time when it's active. And then when it finishes, um, we'll make a note that, okay, this is when the green light's on and it wants us to, to uh, open it. And then, so now I know the times in this long sequence of values. The program uh, is pretty simple. It outputs this tab separated uh, file of the, what time it is, uh, from zero, the milliamps, the millivolts, the milliwatts. So it's just, it's this for like an hour. Uh, I did it like every one second for an hour. Um, and it will tell you, I'm mostly interested in the rightmost column, which is the milliwatts. So this is what we use for our calculation, but I just put everything in there in case one ended up being better than the other. 
Did that just end uh, up being the easiest thing to draw out of the the data, or? Yeah, it seemed like that was the least noisy, or oh, okay. it was the most um, precise. I guess it looked like the milliamps. Both of them have this problem, but they will both read zero a lot of the time when it's low, and I think that's just down to the sensitivity of the the current sensing hardware yeah. in the in the sensor. So I mean, different different energy meters are going to have different sensitivities. And this one just can't go quite so low. They're I cheap, little, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think you would need something a lot fancier and a lot more maybe like not general purpose mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted something like really, really precise for very, very low levels. And also it can't do really, really high levels. Like it's only 110. Yeah. It can't do like more than 15 amps, for example. It, it's not meant for that. So this one, this seemed to be like the least noisy. Uh, or the less noisy compared to the amperage. Um, I think the lowest it does is like 250. And then you'll just get a bunch of zeros. Even if the light's on, even the green light is actually illuminated, you will get a bunch of zero values. Mm. So, and that's more prevalent for the amperage, I think, or it's, there's there's more noise and less signal on the amperage column. So I, I went with the, mil, the, the milliwatts. Cool. Um, we also discard all zero values when we're, in this in this program, they're just there are too many of them, and they could indicate lots of different things. So anything that's a zero, we just kind of skip that pulling cycle. We just move, wait wait for the next one to come around, move on. Um, the this is the code for it. It's we're not doing a whole lot here. We're pretty much just connecting to the power outlet. I'll show this library as well. This is from a, a library I wrote for the Casa outlet. Um, there wasn't one for C sharp, so I wrote one. Um, we open up a file and we have a, a one second timer that just repeats where it will get the power usage from the CASA outlet using that CASA library I wrote. And then it just logs it to a new line, uh, tab separated, and it'll, it'll end when you hit control C. So a pretty pretty basic thing. You just end up with a, a big honking file at the end. Uh, yeah. and, and that's ready to be imported into Excel or or Google Sheets, or some, if you want to like analyze it with some other program that you write, like after that, you can ingest that into something. Um, we were joking when we were having some some problems after a firmware update to the power outlet that changed some of the calibrations that we should start using like a Grafana instance to graph all this stuff. And um, if you're really, really serious about your laundry, yeah, yeah. But, oh my gosh, I was I was considering it. Um, <laughs> I I decided that if I couldn't fix the problem with just like rolling back a firmware update, I would, and it, and it kept being like missed calibrations basically, or like oh. deviating from what I'd seen, I would try doing that. But um, luckily the firmware update ended up being resolved where I probably could have gotten new magic numbers by redoing this entire like spreadsheet process where you like run this whole program. Yeah. I was, it was actually able to do it a different way by rolling back to an older version of the firmware, which itself was really non-obvious how to do that. Um, but there's a there's an undocumented API command with that JSON API with the cost outlet where you can tell it a URL that it should use, and it will oh. use that for a firmware update. Um, I'll show the, um, there's a security company that did a, uh, a really great uh, disassembly and a decompilation of all the firmware. They got all these commands, so I didn't find them myself. I was uh, there's a really good resource for that that I used, and then the second part that was tricky about that was the firmware URLs are not like public, so you can request the latest one from some well-known API, but they're not going to give you historical ones, which is sure. what I wanted. I knew what the old version number was, but you need additional info to construct the URL, which is like a timestamp down to the second, so you can't really brute force it. Um, what ended up happening to, or what helped me there was somebody on one of their, like the TP-Link forums was having a problem. And I think they had posted some logs in their forum post saying, I'm having this error. And like, I tried like this firmware update or something, and I'm still getting this error. Like, can you figure this out? I don't think there was an answer to that person's problem, but in their logs that they posted, they did show the URL that was the old version I wanted. Ooh, handy. Yeah. So. And I really couldn't find any other ones. So it's very like secret. But that one person who I don't know if I could find their post again, but maybe I could, um, they really helped me out by posting this 
non-discoverable URL of a firmware file. So I've saved that file to my hard drive in case I need it again. Yeah. But th I got lucky on that one. I That was like a really small percentage stroke of luck. And I was probably going to have to redo this whole process, but you can redo it. It's not like, yeah. it's not too bad. Um, the uh, So what this ends up looking like once you put this into Excel, I took the different um, rows of the of the output there and took all the milliwatt values and then broke it up into three columns depending on which state I knew it was in based on the timing. So anything before the active time finished, I put into the first column. And then I did the same thing for the complete column and the idle column. So now I know these are all the values that are active and I can tell the maximum minimum of those are between these two numbers. Um, just gonna make that any bigger so you can see it. So anything basically above a thousand milliwatts, that means the machine is running and doing laundry. Um, and so that's kind of this area of my of my breakdown, yeah. my classification. And then complete, I was seeing this range of values, 423 to 499. Uh, so we know that if we're just under 499, we're, we're complete. And then idle is 461 to 278. Oh yeah, they do overlap. So then, huh? there's overlap here. Yeah. So for example, if you had 450 milliwatts, that could be in the idle column or the complete right. column. They're both in there. Or sorry, uh, yeah. So that was where it got tricky, and that's represented by this more verbose uh, section of the classification. If it's below that, it's pretty easy. But in here, that could be either complete or idle. And um, when I graphed it to see what was going on there. The complete graph is this nice bell curve, but the left half of it, the x-axis are not aligned here. Yeah, I, I can't really do that too well in Excel in this in this way of doing it. But the left half of the, this complete bell curve is the same x-axis range as, or domain as the right half of the idle one. So if you see that value, like like 450 is like around here, that's the same as over here. It could be in either one. You don't really know just purely based on the milliwatts if it's supposed to be complete or if it's supposed to be idle. If it's the left half of idle or the right half of complete, that's unambiguous. You know for certain whether it's one or the other, but there's this overlap. So I dug into what the overlap actually looks like with a stacked histogram or a percentage-based histogram. So the blue is complete for the higher milliwatts and the orange is idle for the lower milliwatts. And we see that for a big range of it, it's 100% confidence that it's in one state or the other, but there's this transition zone where yeah. it kind of curves down a little bit and then tapers off where you're not 100% certain either way. And that's represented by this orange shaded area. And this is the frequency. So you can see the odds, if you see a value at 460, it's pretty good odds, but not 100% odds that it's um, in the complete state. So the uh i'll go back to that state diagram um after this but what i ended up figuring out was that the best way to handle this was any value that is in the rightmost part here or in the orange zone here the the ambiguous zone that will count as complete and that will take you out of the active state into the complete state but um and then if it's if it's below that it will be unambiguously the the, the done state and the, the case from going to active all the way to the right hand or to the left hand side here is that you hit the cancel button uh, you just held down the oh yeah it, you didn't, it never completed you just like interrupted it because you wanted to put something else into it after you uh, started it um, but if you if you get into that um, that idle state you have to go all the way past this zone of ambiguity into the the area where you get zero completed in order to go to the idle state. So you'll never go idle unless you're 100% sure that this is always going to be idle and you're, there's never going to be any confusion about that. And what avoided the the repeated like page duty alerts in the middle of the night if the power level fluctuates, yeah. is you, you can't go back from the left side to the right. Okay. So you're going to stay on the left side. You can't go into this this orange zone from the left. So even if it rises a little bit and it will kind of scoot around, I guess there's some kind of like circuitry in there that does something, 
or the sensor is noisy, it will never go back from the um, idle state into the complete state. So that's why the um, that's why the state diagram does not have a left arrow from idle to complete. So it's a one-way operation. Um, if you want to go from idle into complete, you're going to have to go all the way through a new laundry cycle through the active state for it to do a load of laundry and then go back to complete. So that keeps it from flapping around between the two yeah. low power states. Because the domestic power is noisier and dirtier than we think it should be when you're dealing with this kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. And I, th I think the sensors are not like, you know, laboratory grade sensors. Yeah. And, and the machine itself might have some kind of background process where it maybe checks to see if a door is open or something mm -hmm. or has some kind of, I mean, it's it's not a very new machine that has like a very complicated set of sensors. It's the machines I'm dealing with are, I think, probably like early nineties, mid nineties, something like that, okay. just based on, I haven't gotten a year out of anything and the manuals don't say, but just based on kind of how they're designed and what they, what the outside looks like, what the inside looks like. I'm kind of taking a guess there based on other devices I've seen of that same era. Um, it looks a lot like the inside of like an early nineties, like stereo system I've taken apart. <laughs> okay. So they're not like super new. They're not yeah. running like, like a general purpose operating system with like Wi-Fi and everything. They're pretty basic. So I don't think they're doing a whole lot in the background. Like they don't have a Bluetooth connection they're maintaining, sure. but yeah. they could be doing something and that could be giving us a little bit of noisiness here. And like you said, it's, it's just residential power. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how good that even is. So this is what I ended up with after all of the, uh, all, all those histograms and figuring out those state transitions was, uh, was this. So the two numbers that we take from this uh, state diagram and put into our configuration file are the 413, that's the lower end of, um, of the complete, and then 750 milliwatts of the upper end of the complete state. Okay. So that separates our active to our complete to our idle. And that ends up going uh, here. So we can we can tell it to, to use these values. Um, if you were doing this yourself, you would probably have to go through a similar process of figuring out, okay, what, what values do you have for your machine um, with probably a similar like dump some logs with yeah. what the distributions are and then put those in your config file. So this part is not very transferable, but hopefully the technique is, uh, is transferable. Um, so I think that was, yeah, there's just some basic stuff here about uh, starting the background service. So it runs when Windows starts and then uh, it will send pager alerts when we transition between any of those three states. So it will send a change event when you uh, start a load of laundry, just for your reference, uh, it can be helpful if you maybe, it was helpful during debugging if you get spurious end events, you're not sure what, was there actually a start event? Yeah. Um, but also just if you, I don't know, it seems like a nice complete thing to do here. And then the big thing is there's an incident that we create with an alert when it finishes. So uh, this is on the Android UI, but we'll, a load of laundry and make an incident there. And then it will show you the linked change event that happened an hour before that. And uh, you can acknowledge it if you want to, and it will automatically resolve when you uh, open the open the door. So you don't have to go into PagerDuty and resolve it yourself. It's oh, nice. Resolving. OK. And that was a big requirement for me because I wanted to I wanted to not take like two steps forward and one step back with adding some convenience, but also adding a lot of more extra like annoyance and steps and, and work to this. Yeah. Because like if all I was doing was making busy work for people, especially like, you know, my roommates, if I'm doing it to myself, that's one thing, but if I'm making other people's lives harder, that's another thing. So I want to make sure that all these alerts would be auto resolving when the, when you open it. So you don't have to like whip out your phone and tell PagerDuty, yes, this is resolved. Because right. I mean, what if I didn't resolve? Like, what, what, what if I didn't actually open the door? Or what if I forget? Or what if it keeps emailing me and now I'm like, oh, now I'm like annoyed at PagerDuty, even though it's not really their fault. It's just like you're sending events because I haven't actually resolved it. So with this one, this was resolved through the API 
because we detected that state transition from complete to idle. So right. we keep okay. the dedupe key in memory from the initial alert that PagerDB sends us, and then we send the um, the resolved. Event. Nice. So it will stop like reminding you. That was really convenient. Um, the so the, the biggest. Well, not biggest. The second biggest challenge for the, the washing machine was talking to the smart outlet. They have an Android app and an iOS app, but they don't really have a public API. A lot of the development around this, uh, integrating with this device is on the Python side. Um, a lot of home automation uses mm -hmm. Python. Yeah, it does. People are really, really into that. And like all of um, HomeKit and HomeBridge are all Python based. Mm -hmm. So gigantic library, a gigantic corpus of libraries so you talk to all sorts of different devices in your home, um, and they're all Python. So I was using .NET, and the the Python implementations were really good references, um, including the the command line ones. Um, I think it was called uh, I think Python Casa was really helpful because not only is it a library, you can also run it from the command line, and I could just have to open the terminal and get some. Uh, check my work and make sure that I'm doing the right thing and, and getting the right values. But um, this is a really, really nice library. So if you're trying to do something with a, a CASA outlet, this is a great choice for figuring out all sorts of stuff, sending commands to it. Um, so this is my reference implementation. Uh, the actual, this was a really good blog post, or um, yeah, I guess blog post from the security company, Softest Check. They tore this device down, and this is really, really well written. Um, this is an inspiring teardown that I, I would love to make one this nice myself one day. But they pulled this thing apart. They they wire sharked it. They decompiled it. They bin walked it. Um, they they decompiled all this firmware. They figured oh out the gosh. communications. Uh, this is the protocol that we are using. Um, so this is the TCP thing with this very goofy encryption, uh, but they describe it for us. They decompiled this from the Android app, which is really sweet. And they're giving us this Java code here that shows it's a cipher based on a known initial value. And then you just loop through every byte and you're just flipping every byte with this XOR. So this may look like nonsense, uh, and that's because it is nonsense. It's a very silly way to encrypt anything because there's no, there's no like shared secret. It's just yeah. a hard coded constant. If you know the number negative eighty five, you're good to go. You've decrypted it. You're a hacker, so you can implement this in your favorite programming language, and you'll be able to uh, send JSON to this device and receive JSON from it. If you can do this, um, it just takes the UTF eight bytes of the JSON and you do this to it. Yeah. Um, so they they pulled this out of the Android app, and there are a couple other blog posts that people also have where they uh, where they got this figured out. Um, the other cool thing is they wrote a dissector for Wireshark, which will automatically, whenever it sees one of these packets going by, they wrote their own custom decryptor that will show you the JSON. So you don't have to like manually copy and paste some like blob of binary into some program that you wrote that is able to like do that for loop. Uh, they just have this Wireshark plugin for you. Oh, that's that will do it for automatically. Yeah. That's really, that's really sweet. I didn't actually know before this, you could write your own Wireshark dissectors, but I would love to try that someday. I learned been, that right now as well. I had no so idea cool. why Wireshark wouldn't let you do that. Uh, apparently it's written in Lua. Oh, okay. So very cool. And once they did that, they just, got all the commands out of this thing. They figured out all these different categories. These are families of commands that have like multiple commands inside of them, kind of grouped by theme. And they just got all of them. So they figured out, okay, here's the guess this info command, which tells you like all sorts of information about like the firmware and the state and everything. And they just went through that for all of them and tons of commands. This was the, the firmware one that I used for the downgrade. Um, they they checked, here's where they decompiled the firmware to say, okay, here's where the signature check happens. So you can't like push your own firmware. 
that's very cool. They've got the the Ida Pro decompilation there. Um, I tried re uh, replicating their steps, but I think the way they packed the firmware changed since they wrote this, so my mm. bin walk uh, command didn't work. I'm not sure what's different about it, but something has changed. Um, they went through all this stuff. The really useful thing that came out of this for me was the complete list of commands that they published. So this is from the same people, but they converted it into this text file. And they just list every single JSON command, like turning on and off the outlet, turning on off the LED. Um, the one I'm using is these E meter commands for the energy meter, um, especially this one, get real time. So they just have this big honking list of commands. Um, I tried to convert all these into a .NET API. Mm. So that's what this library is. So standing on the shoulders of that uh, reverse engineering blog post from those folks, we've got this library, the CASA library, uh, again, for .NET. And you can create a new instance with your outlet's IP address, and then you can start sending async commands, like, is it on? If it's not on, turn it on, stuff like that. Um, I've used it with a couple of different devices, and you can. The hardest part was reconnection logic because this TCP connection uh, it can drop if, if mm. you like your Wi-Fi goes away. So how do you reconnect to that without like making it the user's problem, like the consumer of your library's problem, and the kind of smooth over, smooth over that for them? Um, that was probably the most tricky part, but. There are some configuration options. You can set, like, do you want to reconnect if you drop, or how long do you want to wait between reconnections? Um, you can inject it into your dependency injection scope. Um, but once you have that, you can just call the, the normal commands. So you can, this, this is the family of commands, like system, and then you've got a bunch of different methods. They're all async, and then they, they return stuff. So the command that we're using is, the energy meter command for, here we go. So this is for the energy meter. If you have a device that has an energy meter, so the KP125, for example, um, you can call get instantaneous power usage, and it will asynchronously return to you a struct that has the current, and it has the voltage in it, and it has the power, and those are all what's being used right now. And then there's also a cumulative measure for how many watt hours has it have, have gone through this thing since it last rebooted. Okay. Um, and that's what we're using for the uh, washing machine. So we're pulling out the power value from the struct when we call this. And we're calling this every 15 seconds, I think. So that's what we're using for all those mm -hmm. spreadsheets and, and analyses. Um, the, uh, th there are also long-term reports if you want to know like an entire month's or entire year's worth of stuff. And there's also just a bunch of other commands too, like turn on and off on a timer and turn on and off the LED and all sorts of things. Um, so like the thing that turns on and off my phone charger just uses the the set outlet on command with an on and off. So it just, when my battery gets below 20%, it'll turn the charger on. When the battery gets above 80%, it'll turn the outlet off. It just uses this command. So that's the CASA one. Um, I, I'm actually surprised that this thing is as robust as it is. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of commands in here for, yeah, they did a good job with it. I was pretty impressed actually. I wish it were more like publicly friendly yeah, and like, you know, documented and made into a real API. I mean, I like real APIs. It's something I've you know, worked on before and really enjoyed making something that's like public and stable and documented and dependable and well thought out. This is most of them, but it's not really public. So it'd be cool if it were, but it does have a lot of functionality and the devices do seem very reliable. So I'm happy with the cost of devices so far. They, they're, they're pretty serious devices. So I like them. Super neat. And then the last part that I felt the need to write myself for the laundry machine was uh, the pager duty API client, which is what I posted about on the forum. Yeah, because so, we we don't have a lot of users using .NET, I guess, or if they yeah. if they are, they have not told us about it. So. Yeah, I think historically it seems I'm a bit kind of new to .NET. I have not been using it for as long as some other languages. Um, mostly, I've been doing Java. Um, I think there is a PagerDuty Java library already, um, 
but .NET has kind of been getting more serious over the years, especially in the last like five or so years. They've been getting a lot more open source, a lot more mm -hmm. cross-platform is the big thing. It used to be yeah. very like Windows only and not really used for anything besides like Windows-based server-side web applications and like GUI applications with WPF. Now it's a lot more general purpose. They're trying to go after like the Node.js Express use case, the Ruby Sinatra use case, where I just want a lightweight web server yeah. and it can run on Linux and it's in some container or whatever. And they've really transformed the language into something that can support that in a way that's not as like pigeonholed as the old Windows way of doing things. So they've made a lot of strides there and I, it's kind of having a resurgence. It was really popular in like 15 years ago and then it dropped yes. off because it definitely like, had a heyday. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah Everyone's yeah. like, well, why don't I just use Ruby or Node or Python or like Java for all this stuff? I just want a web, I just want like an API server somewhere. And .NET wasn't well suited to that. Now they've actually put a lot more effort into it and it's a lot more uh, able to be used for that sort of thing. So I think that's pretty cool. And I happen to like the language. It's very Java like. So I like that already. Um, so I found a couple of other PagerDuty libraries. Um, which I'm glad they exist. This is no shade on them, but I had some other requirements that none of them fulfilled all of them. The yeah. biggest one was unit testability. I wanted to be able to write unit tests of my, like of the laundry program mm -hmm. and not have it send real PagerDuty events during those unit tests. Yeah. So I wanted to mock out the, uh, the PagerDuty client, the same way you would mock out like an HTTP client or a database or something else you don't want actually running during your unit tests. Yeah. Cause I don't want to have to like, have a separate pager duty tenant that is just dedicated to unit testing. What if I'm not even connected to the internet when I, my tests run? Do I have to worry about like passing around this real integration key that like is, is kind of a secret and then have that be checked into right. my library? I want it to be mocked out. I just want it to call a fake method when I, when I do that and then have it not do anything or do my pre-programmed like test only behavior of like returning true or throwing an exception or whatever I want to test. So that was the big thing that I think none of them really handled too well. There were some other ones that didn't handle, they only handled triggering events, but not resolving them. And some of the um, some of the other ones, like they were very static. They It was not easy to make different instances of them. So mm -hmm. you could customize the behavior. Everything was a singleton. Everything was like a, just a static singleton. So I tried to make something that was a little bit more like the kind of libraries I like using. So it's all interface based. Um, you can easily make a mock in, uh, instance of it with just your favorite mocking library that has an interface. It, you don't have to send any real events anywhere. Um, and it just uses the, it's just the events v2 API. It's not any of the other API uh, API families in PagerDuty. But um, I tried to make it just as discoverable as possible. So you can autocomplete or control space your way to success with this one because once you get you can just start typing the name of the library, basically. It will auto-complete the namespace or auto-complete the class name based on that. And there's only like, there's a constructor you call and there's only one method on it for, for send, mm -hmm. I think. So you should be able to just use the IntelliSense dropdown in Visual Studio or whatever you're using to automatically just look at the types you're, you're calling and figure out, okay, here's the method you can call. Here are the different values you can put into that method as arguments. Here are the different like enum values that you can use for your severity. And it just guides you to, whatever you're trying to do, create yeah. an alert, resolve an alert. It'll just, the IDE will do it for you. We'll just show you like the way. And um, here's a little example where you trigger an alert with some with a string and then resolve it 30 seconds later based on the dedupe key that came from the alert. And that's kind of it. This was pretty simple. I mean, this was just like, there was nothing weird about this. There was no like, some crazy initialization vector with uh, some for loop you have to do to encrypt anything. It's just like, you know, the documentation, I have to say, I love good documentation. So that was the thing I was most impressed by with PagerDuty is the API docs are complete. They are, they are good. Um, nothing really surprised me with that one. Glad um, to hear it. Uh, yeah, that was, this was kind of like, I think that this is the part I did last because I knew it was the least risky because mm -hmm. I knew that, that talking to that Casa owl, that was going to be really, really weird. And I wasn't sure if it was going to work. So I did the risky one first. And then this is more of a victory lap where it's just like, okay, sit down and write an API client. <laughs> and it's not even a very big one. So this was like really easy. Um, you can configure some HTTP options. This is actually a suggestion from someone. Uh, after I posted about it on the forum, someone filed an issue that they tried to use it with a tenant that was hosted in the EU in the European oh, Union. Oh, sure, yeah. And um, previously, my library was hard-coded to always use the default cluster, which was yeah. events. 
and they were saying right, if i'm my tenant needs a different base rail because i'm not on this default cluster i'm on the eu cluster so um is there some way for me to like give you a different url so i added that as a configuration option it will still default to the global one or whatever it's called but you can change it to whatever you want to i suppose this could also be useful if you wanted to use like a staging server if that's something you have um and then yeah it's just triggering an alert you can pass all the different options that are present on on the alerts api that pagerd exposes but you don't have to if you don't want to you can just yeah only do the required fields and it will give you back a uh the alert response which contains your ddupe key once you have that you can acknowledge it with the ddupe key to say that yeah i'm looking at this or you can say this issue is done um this is what the on your machine fires when you open the lid and it will take the dedupe key and just resolve that alert for you um, and you can do change events here too um, all the exception handling is just from the documentation from pager duty um, and we linked all the documentation so this is pretty good i think yeah. the only thing that confused me about this project was actually microsoft's fault not pager duty's fault because mm -hmm. microsoft is the only place in the world that loves putting byte order markers on UTF-8 streams. Oh, geez. yeah. And I don't know if you've seen that before, but the number of times I've gotten some weird problem I can't figure out, and it ends up being this, after like hours and hours of just spinning in circles, not knowing what to do, I will eventually figure out, oh, I like wrote this thing with, you know, I redirected it from standard output from PowerShell, yeah. or like I'm returning this with some method in, like half the methods in .NET that emit UTF-8 do this and half of them don't. They're trying to make it like, file based but not like substring based which kind of makes sense but no one should be putting by order markers on utf8 streams they're supposed to be backwards compatible with you know ascii and and yeah. iso 88591 they're not supposed to have by order markers yeah they're illegal and yes parsers are supposed to handle them but none of them do and the number of problems i've had i had pager duty would return a 400 if you send an http post that has a that starts with a by order marker yeah. Um, even if you have the like, content type application JSON slash um, like UTF-8, um, Google Google Calendar. If you point Google Calendar to a an ICS file like a WebCal file that starts with the by order marker, it will just it like, reject it. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, do it. it just crashes or yeah. something. Um, it doesn't happen if you upload the file, but if you point it to a URL, it will then it will crash. So they're two different like ways of doing it. And there is oh a spam assassin. I was trying to migrate some my spam assassin database from an old version to a new version and there's like an export command and i think the export command i happened to foolishly run it in powershell and redirect the output so it prepended it with a by order marker and every time i tried to import that into the new version it would crash and luckily that was open source and i was able to figure out like what i found i searched for the error message in the source code and i was like okay what is this thing actually trying to do it, it's telling me this is not a valid file but i know it's a valid file so what check is it failing that it thinks is a valid file? And it was like a regex that was anchored at the start of the file. And I was like, okay, well, clearly the start of my file isn't what I think it is. Is there some invisible character? And I was like, oh, it's byte order markers. Of course it is. So I spent hours on that one. You have been to the mountain on this project. Oh my I'm, goodness. I was so frustrated. I was frustrated enough that I actually wrote a, it's not part of this one. Um, this is just hard coded to not use. Um, UTF-8 because it's like a library. I didn't want to import libraries into libraries, but I now have a, a different library that I can like use where it will just edit the memory of the, the running .NET process to change the default value of the, um, there's like a, a global static for the UTF-8 encoder that you always just like oh. reference and that, um, or refer to it, it, oh, it's set to use the by order marker by default. Uh, it's a construct it's a constructor argument but it's a singleton that they've constructed you can't change it afterwards it's a commutable so um i <laughs> i figured out how to like flip a bit in memory oh, in your dude. it doesn't affect other people's processes and it doesn't survive a process restart but if you call it at the top of your process uh -huh. it will flip that bit in memory of your process so anytime you ask for like the global static of what is the utfa encoder or decoder it will I, I've mutated the immutable object by flipping a bit in memory at a specific offset. Um, oh, dude. And oh, my gosh. <laughs> that, was, I, that was more like I was more vindictive about that one than anything else. I was I was powered by frustration. 
uh, and not like like this was this was nice. I was just like kind of cruising along and like I'm going to send events to this thing, and it's like it's going to do it. Yeah, I'm creating value where there previously was not value, and like for for me at least, and it was just kind of smooth sailing. The other one, I was just like really annoyed. <laughs> it's like I'm going to fix this no matter what it takes, and I don't care what anyone else says. Um, that was fun. So now I usually don't have that problem uh, with, with byte order markers, and I've I've kind of gotten more used to picking up on that being an issue. Yeah, it's kind of notorious, unfortunately. Um, so I think that's pretty much it for the washing machine. Um, do we want to look at the dryer stuff? I'm not sure what the timing is like. Um, let's see. Yeah, we can we can take some time to do that if you still have time. We do have one additional question in the chat um, about your going from complete to idle. Uh, did you, at that point, uh, as you're looking at that, if since you're tracking state and time anyway, were you looking at maybe um, the, looking at the, the threshold dropping below a certain threshold for a period of time, like saying, okay, it's it's this low beyond my, your, your 400, whatever it is for five minutes or anything like that? Or were you looking more like a more of an immediate, wanted yeah, to know I, as soon as it was done kind of idea? I was definitely considering that. I'm trying to remember what exactly my logic was. I think that was my plan B if I couldn't get it to work with this immediate state diagram mm -hmm. was to add a, like a time series um, way of looking at that. So I was like really close to implementing that if I couldn't get this to work because um, I wasn't sure if this was going to be sufficient or if the overlap would be too big yeah. or if it would, if having this one way thing would cause like too much lag um, or if there were too many zero values that came back. Mm -hmm. I was, I think I was like, right about to start doing a time-based analysis of that, but yeah. ended up not needing to. Cool. How long did this whole project sort of take you? Um, it was very drawn out because I was kind of starting it and then getting frustrated or distracted or something. So yeah. I remember I initially bought some vibration sensing coils from Adafruit in like 2014 and okay. didn't think they were sensitive enough. So I kind of forgot about it for years and years and years. Um, it's a spring inside of like a coil that will touch a rod to complete a circuit. Mm -hmm. And depending on how stiff the spring is, that's how sensitive it is. But I tried kind of messing with those and I don't think any of them were sensitive enough. And I was worried if I got too sensitive, it would just like someone walking by might trigger it or the sure. machine next to it. Cause they kind of bump into each other. Yeah, they do. Each other. Yeah. I was worried that would cause all sorts of like crosstalk there. So that was 2014. I kind of, oh put that on the back burner and gave up on that and forgot about it. And it was really, I think, learning about the smart outlets. I don't know if I saw some article about them or, or like a sale or something, but I think that was, I think most of this happened just um, like last year um, mm -hmm. over the summer, I think. So just kind of the middle of 2023. I did the the laundry machine, the washing machine first, probably in like May, maybe. Um, and then, or maybe even earlier than that. Um, and then the, uh, I wonder if this will even tell me. Oh no, I was doing this. Oh, this is actually 2022. Okay. So I did, I guess mid 2022 was the washing machine. And then a year later, mid 2023 was the, um, the dryer. Dryer. Wow. Okay. And this, that. I'm just amazed. Like I, the smart outlets are like, they seem so clever. And like, I do have a couple in the house for various things. And at the same time, like the apps are, are fine, but like, they're not, they're not good enough for, yeah. for so many things you would might want to do with these things. Like they're just not extensible enough for anything super clever, or even super helpful. Like, okay, I can turn this thing on and off with my phone, like big deal. But um, yeah, that's, this is a fascinating little project. So we do have plenty of time. If you want to take us okay. through the high level of the dryer, um, cause this is a different implementation, right? It was yeah. a different solution, um, for this one. Right. Yeah. The only thing it actually shares is the pager duty client. Everything else is different. Um, so yeah, I can do a high level and then we can see how much we want to go into a lower, lower level stuff, depending on the time. Cool. But yeah, that was a big criteria for me for choosing this particular power outlet was how hackable is it? Like, yeah. Does it have an API? And the HomeKit forums were actually really useful for that because they have people, a whole bunch of people who want to know, can they use this thing with uh, 
or sorry, not home. That's the Apple thing. Uh, Homebridge. Homebridge. Um, okay. They want to really keep track of does this work with Homebridge? Is our Python library up to date? Whenever new models come out, someone's always going to post uh, an issue saying, "Hey, is this supported?" And people will answer them. Owners who can share information. So big community there. They can really help each other out. Um, so that, I definitely checked on all that stuff, including like version compatibility, but before buying one of these things. So I was confident that the Casa stuff was able to. I was able to use it, and it wasn't yeah. all locked down. Um, so the dryer stuff was uh, last summer, and this was mostly challenging because it's a really high current, high amperage device. Yeah. So I, I, this is not a gas dryer. This is an electric dryer. So all the heating oh. happens with electricity as well. So it has one of the really big 220 volt, 30 amp plugs, the big circle that's like the size of your fist. Yep. It's, it's not a 110 outlet. So you can't buy a Casa outlet that supports this thing. They only sell the 110s. The only off the shelf uh like energy meters I could find that would even support this are designed for people who want to monitor their pool heaters for their outdoor pools because those use 220. Those are pretty expensive, yeah. the energy meters. They're like $200 each as opposed to like $15 for the Casa 110 meter. And you have to hire an electrician to come and do work on your circuit breaker to install this thing because it yeah. needs like extra legs to be available to it. So I did not really want to do that. Um, and I wanted to see if there was some way to do this off the shelf. So I went through a bunch of different ideas and, you know, 10 false starts before getting a real idea that worked. I was thinking about the vibration sensor, a temperature sensor for the exhaust to see if hot air was coming out of it. Um, I was thinking about a microphone to see if it was making noise. Mm. Um, I was thinking about if I could put a magnet on the drum that you could spin around and then detect that the magnet was going by with the Hall effect sensor, like a bike speedometer. Um, there were some other ideas too. I don't remember. Um, a bike speedometer would be fascinating. Oh my gosh, how fast does a drawer actually yeah. go? Yeah, I, I put a magnet inside the drum and then tried to like see if I could put, have a compass uh, outside to see if it would deflect. Um, it would, but there also is a lot of other magnetism also involved from mm. like i think when the washing machine ran it emitted something that would have caused it to deflect so it didn't seem like a slam dunk the way that like a bike speedometer is like not really gonna have much interference yeah um, i was thinking about okay what if i open this thing up and like disconnect or clip some wires and put a sensor in line with with those wires there are no lights unfortunately so you can't just right. like yeah. Put a sensor on a light, but there are other wires for like other things. So what I ended up figuring out for this one was induction sensors. So you clamp a sensor. Uh, here's one of the ones I was using. So it's this clamp that you put around the, the wire and it clips on. You don't have to cut the wire and it's not invasive and it's isolated from the circuit, but that's able to, when there, whenever there's current in the wire going through it, it'll induce a current in the uh, in the clamp, okay. so it's a current transformer, and that's really nice. People use that a lot for detecting loads like this when they don't want to like hack up their device, um, like physically like modify it. And the caveat is you have to have only one wire going through it. So if you have a multi wire mm -hmm. like a positive and a negative, that won't work because they'll cancel each other out. But if you can separate them either with an exacto knife or with a special like adapter. Or if they are individual wires in the first place, then you can use those. So that's what I ended up going with. I got an excuse to get a real clamp multimeter to replace my cheaper, older <laughs> one. Okay. So this is really nice. Um, and I was able to just open up the dryer and figure out with the with this clamp sensor which of the wires I needed to look at and which of those I could maybe use to trigger pager duty alerts. I love the pictures on here with you opening up the dryer. Like it Yeah. The the, the ones with the little crowbar kind of made me nervous. I'm like, what is he doing to this dryer? I know. Um, yeah, I, I, I have no idea what they look too. like. Yeah. I, I thought it was gonna be harder than it was. It turns out they're they're a lot more straightforward than I thought. And I watched a bunch of YouTube videos from yeah. they have a lot of technicians who will just show, oh, here's how you open this thing up and replace, like a heating coil, yeah. or here's how you open it up and replace. I think I watched one where a guy uh he was like a technician that went to someone's house for a service call and replaced the the timer dial, 
which is a very expensive and apparently error prone part of the the dryer. And he showed how to like pop the top um, oh, control yes. panel open. And he was showing how he was putting his clamp sensor on different wires to diagnose, okay, I think this part's working, this part's working, this part's working, this part's failing. And I saw that. I'm like, if this guy can do it, I can do it. I'm going to get a clamp sensor. I'm going to watch all the videos from my specific model of people like replacing things. Cause it's a lot, it's very like do it yourself repair based yeah. for all this education. People post lots of videos for these things. So I watched all of those and I was like, okay, I can do this. So I ended up uh, opening it up. Here's my tools. I've got a Phillips screwdriver and I've got a panel puller. Um, this is used for like opening up like door panels and cars or any upholstery and they're plastic so they don't scratch too much. And I use this for um, just opening up some of the clips that are hard to get open here. Um, you've got two screws. This is the lint trap. Once you open it, it exposes your two screws. So you unscrew these, don't drop them in the chute. And then you can put this puller underneath the top lid. So you're trying to open up the lid and it opens away from you, kind of like a car hood that opens away from you. And it hinges in the back and you just push it away. And I propped it up with like an aluminum crutch. And there's two of these clips on each side, one on the left, one on the right. And then you can get to, you'll see the drum sitting inside once you do that. And well, I wanted to access down there after a whole bunch of looking around and fiddling, I'm um, skipping to the, I figured it out part, which makes me sound smarter than I really am. Cause I just spent a whole lot of time poking and trying different things. But this is at the back of that main box of the cabinet. So you can see kind of the curved part of the drum in the middle yeah. and this is the rear of it where the hinge is all these wires are going down the uh i hope that leaf blower isn't going to be too distracting but we've got this orange wire here that we've clipped our sensor onto is the wire that controls the light that turns on when you open the door so it's in the back of the um the drum there's a little incandescent bulb and it turns on whenever the door is open okay. so there's a switch in the door that that will connect that circuit the light turns on and I'm clamping onto that. And the uh, there are two clamps involved. The other one besides this light one is for the motor to run. And I found that one was available in the top half of the uh, of the control panel. That's above the, uh, the main cabinet. So I close the bottom and then you wanna get the top control panel, which is this triangular thing at the very top here where all the buttons and switches are. You can pop that open by pushing this inwards to squeeze a clip together and make it let go. And then you can lift the top of the control panel backwards and away from you. It's just this triangular empty space here. And there uh, on the right side here with the wires going into it, this is the start stop button, or I guess the start button. It will it will start the motor and send send current to the motor when you press in on it. And I found by just clamping on every single wire in here that these blue wires coming from that button are what power the motor so these go to the motor so we've got a separate clamp onto that part here so now we know when the motor is running and uh there are different sensitivities for these clamps and uh i think one's like a five amp and one's a 60 amp because they just use different amounts but mm -hmm. we now have two of these clamp sensors inside of our dryer to tell us when the motor's running and when the light is on so the logic I ended up using is when the when the motor's on, we're seeing about four amps from this thing. And when we're seeing zero amps, that means the motor stopped. And then for the light bulb, um, when the door is closed, we're seeing zero amps for the light bulb. And then when the door's open, we're going to see, I think, 0 0.08 amps or 80 milliamps when the light's on. Um, so that's how we know. It's the same logic as the washing machine. So mm -hmm. when the motor is running, we go into the active state. When the motor stops, we go into the complete state. And then when the light bulb turns on, that means you open the door. So we go into the idle state and we resolve the page duty alert. Okay. And the logic was not too bad. Um, but so uh, the we didn't have to deal with any like weird TCP protocols or um, encryption or anything like that. Um, or any like funny noisy data with like the state transitions. But I did have to figure out how to convert these analog signals from these current transformers into the digital signals that represented the real um, 
I think amperage in this case mm -hmm. from the devices. So that was kind of tricky. Um, once you got the current transformers in there, actually, I want to show this diagram. This was a piece of paper taped inside the top of the control panel by the manufacturer. And it's very, very cool looking. And I wish I had a date on it, but it's showing the, uh, the wiring diagram for the dryer. There are, there are two sections because they sell this thing in a electric model and a gas model. I have the electric model. So only the top half is relevant to my, uh, my situation. Um, there's also some detailed views down at the bottom for the, the timer dial and the, uh, mm -hmm. this is actually the connector for the door switch. So I, that was pretty helpful. I thought I was going to put some sense, like some connectors on that thing, and try to inter intercept that signal. I ended up not doing that, but that is the, uh, the wiring diagram for the door switch. But the top half here is what I was looking at. So for those two clamps I just showed you, uh, this is the start button, the push to start relay. This is the blue wire coming out of it. So this is where we're putting the, the clamp sensor that detects the motor. You can see that blue wire goes all the way to the right into the drive motor. So that's how I knew that that was, that there was a wire going between those two things and what color it was. Uh, so that was really helpful. And then the second helpful thing was the, uh, how to detect that the door is open. I found the drum lamp up here in the top left corner. Oh yeah. And then saw that mm -hmm. that's being powered by, there's 120 volts coming in from the mains and then it's going through our door switch here. Uh, and then the door switch is either gonna supply power to the whole rest of the, the, the machine, the thermostat heater and everything downstream of that, if it's the door is closed. And then it cuts off power to everything when you open the door and it supplies power to the drum lamp when it's open. Um, I think the normal close, normal open terminology here is, is a little bit reversed from what in, you would might imagine, but that's what it's showing here. So I said, okay, I need to get a sensor on this orange wire here. So that's why the orange wire was the one I was using. Um, the other fun fact was that my bulb was burned out when I started doing this. So I need to order a new bulb because when your bulb is burned out, it's always going to be zero amps no matter what you do. Yeah, it's so amazing. the machine will run, but it will never give you the data you need from here. So I had to buy some new bulbs and that was fine. I also tried getting LED bulbs because I thought, okay, well, they're not going to burn. They're not going to burn out as frequently. They're going to use less power and they're going to be a little more modern. It turns out those use so little electricity that I can't actually measure it with this sensor. Oh, wow. So they were too efficient. I got the smallest sensitivity or the, I guess the most sensitive one I could get from my, I was buying all the stuff from DigiKey. Mm -hmm. and the smallest one they have is a five amp sensor and that can measure the incandescent one at 80 milliamps but the led one when i plugged it in i think both with the um with the the like sensor that i was using for the circuit and also for my multimeter even if you wind the cable around a couple of times the led one is just so low that you're not going to wow. get a reading it's just way too low you would need a, a more sensitive sensor than what I was getting like off the shelf um, or the, the ones I got myself personally. So I, I went back to just the incandescent one. The LED is a cool option, but for this use case, I kind of was stuck with the, yeah with either yeah. using an incandescent one or putting some additional resistors in the, in the LED. I don't even know if that's a good idea. So I learned that. I also wanted to get RGB LEDs, but sadly those are, too physically large to fit in the cavity that is available to them. So I oh, couldn't bummer. have a, a hue shifting gamer dryer. Yes. I, really, I really wanted that. I was, I was, I looked around a lot for that, but the RGB ones are just too physically large and there's not a big space here. There's like a very small cutout that's, that's available. That, that, that is a feature I didn't know that I wanted in my next dryer. But now that I you've said either. that, I, I totally do want different lights in my dryer. Sure. Maybe once these get more miniaturized, we'll be able to, in five years, we'll be able to get multicolor uh, LEDs yes. in that small of a form factor. Party in my dryer, absolutely. Or maybe it's a matter of getting an existing one and like putting a different, like, I don't know, like a cone or a, like the bulb part around it yeah. so that it doesn't like interfere as much with the little like metal tray. Maybe like do some modifications there. But um, so that was... This was how I figured out like where the wiring was. So really, really useful documentation. Really happy to see this inside the dryer and glad that whoever put this in there did. Yeah. Very fascinating stuff. Um, and then the the last part of this, I think, was just the analog to digital, digital conversion. So uh, we need to take 
with these sensors output, these uh, these clamp sensors, they're going to give us a voltage that corresponds to the amperage that was going into them. So you can also get different sensors that will output amperage when you give it amperage. These do it the other way. They're voltage mm -hmm. types. So you give them amperage, they give out voltage, and they're proportional. So this is helpful because that's what a lot of the document or a lot of the example projects I found were doing. I really do not know a lot about any of this stuff. So I was copying other projects and seeing what they did and looking at like Adafruit and other people's just GitHub projects. Um, there are links to all those in the repositories and a lot of credit to all those folks for one, figuring this stuff out and two, writing it up to share it. So yeah. that someone like me who is not an electrical engineer can follow it and understand how to take those building blocks and assemble them to something I need. But what we ended up with was an analog to digital converter uh, circuit. Mm. So this is a chip that is an ADC um, and very popular. So a lot of documentation from people using this and you can put this into a circuit that connects to your Raspberry Pi and takes in the signal from your clamp sensors and is able to get that into real data in a programming language of your choice in your Raspberry Pi. Um, this is the kind of prototype of the board. The chip is on the left here, the analog digital converter chip. The Raspberry Pi is behind it. I'm just using a, I guess using like a Pi 2 or mm -hmm. something. This is a Pi 1, but just an ordinary Raspberry Pi. I like it because it has Wi Fi yeah. and I can use .NET and not some like uh, Arduino, like C thing, uh, which I'm not really a huge fan of, I guess. I like my general purpose operating systems. Understood. Yeah. Definitely. And um, and then on the right-hand side here, we've got the, uh, these are the ports that plug into the little eighth inch uh, wires for the current sensor. And then everything else here, all these capacitors and resistors, these are voltage dividers to help us deal with the fact that the, the actual current, sorry, the actual voltage coming from the sensors is signed it can go it's a sine wave between mm. like a positive and a negative number mm -hmm. because it's, it's a ac uh, signal and then the analog to digital converter only accepts unsigned numbers so it's only going to accept like zero to 1023 it doesn't know what a negative number is so anything that's below zero so half of your sine curves they're going to get clipped to zero um, so all these resistors and capacitors their job is to add a it's called a voltage divider, but they're really adding. They're not dividing. Mm -hmm. They're dividing into two different like positive zones, and they're applying a a bias to the signal. So they're they're just adding five twelve to the value, so that you're getting zero to one thousand twenty three instead of zero to five twelve. But half of that is a bunch of zeros that shouldn't yeah. be there. So you're just trying to lift your curve above the y axis of at zero. Um, and that was all explained to me on all of those pages, uh, which are linked. So this is the, actually, I had one issue where we started getting some spurious page duty alerts. And I think the problem was that I was using this breadboard, which even when I first got it, it was very loose. The mm. connections were not very solid, even compared to other breadboards I've used in the past. It was very wiggly. I think with all the vibration in the dryer, which itself jumps around a bit. And also maybe the thermal cycling, it was just getting a bad connection between some of the things. So it was sending some weird values and we said, oh, it looks like you've done a load of laundry or something and yeah. it was sent duty alert. So I said, okay, I need to replace this. This was a good prototype, but I'm gonna use something a little more solid. And I used this, this is a perma proto board. So I didn't like order my own printed circuit board with any of this stuff, which my friend suggested I do, but that's a little bit that's intense. Yeah. If I need if I need a hundred of these things, I'll consider that. But um, I got this perma proto board. These are through holes. The layout is the same as a breadboard. Um, like the rows are connected and the columns are connected on the sides, and you can just solder into them. So I took all the parts, just replicated the layout onto this perma proto board, and soldered them in. So they're more solid now. Um, I did get this. I did do this right before I upgraded from a pretty old and not easy to use soldering iron to a very nice one for different projects. So this was the last of the very clumsy, very, very cold, very non-professional soldering joints that I, I did. I was considering going back with my new iron that I like a lot more. It was a birthday gift for my parents. 
and redoing it. But I figured, okay, if it breaks again another time, I'll consider doing that. For now, I'll just leave it and then see if it keeps working. Yeah. But now it's all put together with actual solder joints that don't vibrate around. And when you hook up the Raspberry Pi, it looks like this. You run some wires over for 3.3 volts and ground, and then four wires for SPI, which is the protocol that is used to communicate between the Raspberry Pi and the ADC. So you're supplying a clock signal, a data in signal, a data out signal, and a chip select signal because there are eight possible inputs that this ADC can handle. Mm. We're using two of the eight, uh, one for the door light and one for the motor. But it can handle six more if you need it to. And you can buy different sized ADCs as well if you need four or 16 or something like that. So that's what the wires are for. Um, and all of this stuff should eventually convert your uh, your amperage from your motor or your light into a number between 0 and 1023 um, after all of this. And this can get delivered into your program. Uh, there's an SPI kernel driver on the Raspberry Pi. You have to enable it, but it is there. And then there are libraries that can make use of that kernel driver in, in application land. Where um, The one I'm using is the GPIO library from Microsoft. Mm. Um, they have a .NET IoT family of libraries that are really, really helpful. They not only support all the different Raspberry Pi hardware for how do I deal with the different pins and address them and configure stuff and turn on pull-down resistors and everything, but they have a companion library that builds on top of the GPIO stuff that handles all sorts of different devices you might connect to your Raspberry Pi. So they have a class that just handles the MCP3008 and it knows what this device is. It knows what the different pins are and how the SPI works on it. And you can just call a constructor in your code and get all this configured for you. It's extremely nice. That's also linked in the repository. Um, they have great documentation with diagrams and everything. And they show how to, uh, how to make all that stuff work with their example as a potentiometer. Really, really nice documentation for all that. So I'm using that and we're getting we're pulling the uh, we're pulling these sensors at 120 hertz, and then we are keeping track of the last one second worth of values for both of the sensors, and then we're aggregating those into an RMS at a value over one second, and using that to make our decisions about um, is the is the amperage above some threshold or not. The Gnarliest part of that was probably reversing all the different transformations that the current goes through because it gets changed from like, if it starts off at four amps, mm -hmm. it'll get uh, it'll get reduced by the current transformer to a proportional value because it's, it's a much lower voltage that comes out of the current transformer, which is good. Um, uh, I think it's a couple of volts. Um, I th and I think it's based on the reference voltage actually, for, which is 3.3 in this case. And then the voltage divider will shift it. So you have to subtract to undo that. You're just trying to undo all this stuff. Um, the ADC itself is going to rearrange it into the 1024 range. Right. And so there's like five or six steps of math that I'm not sure I did right, but that are transforming your value as it goes in that you have to then undo, just do the inverse of all those things in the opposite order in order to get back the original value. So you can you can use values that make more sense to humans that are looking at like your clamp multimeter when you want to yeah. know how to set this thing. So if I see 4.33 amp, uh, amps on my clamp multimeter, it would be nice if I could use that to configure it by undoing all these values to get the original value instead of like, well, it's something that's in the range of 1024 and it has no basis in reality or that you would ever see on a clamp multimeter. So you kind of just have to like guess and test. I wanted it to be a little more, uh, make a little more sense than that. Yeah. So that math is, it's not hard. It's just like a bunch of like tedious though. Yeah. yeah it's, it's very gross looking because it's a whole big string of like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And there, there are also some square roots in there for the RMS. Um, it's it's really ugly and ugly to the point of being kind of undebuggable. So if there were a problem with that, I'm not really sure how you get in there and say, okay, well, clearly I can see that this looks suspicious or like it's getting this far, but not this far or any yeah. of the normal techniques. It's just like, well, here's a bunch of like gross multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, but we don't really know what's going on there. And I hope it's right. So it ended up being mostly right. I did add a configurable 
gain that you can apply to make it really right, which is really smoothing over the fact that my math is probably wrong. But in this case, since we're not trying to like bill anyone based on it or right. measure the real value, we really just care about measurements now versus our same measurement previously, not like to a real correct reference value. So we don't really care about accuracy here. We just care about precision. So repeatable measurements being kind of consistent, it doesn't really matter if they're based in reality as much. Yeah. So, cause we just want to know if they, if they go above or below some value, even if that value itself is kind of like a little bit made up. But once we did that, uh, I stuck this thing in the top uh, in the control panel here. So that's our motor sensor. I just put it in in the empty space here and kind of orient the stuff to fit. The circuit board here in the Raspberry Pi, there's a power cable that I ran out the right side of it to a power strip to power the Raspberry Pi. Um, and then this vertical circuit board on the right, this white thing, that's part of the dryer itself. That's not mine. Oh. That's that's pre-existing. So that's not part of what I did. Um, so this is actually low. You, you've got it inside the it's inside is okay yeah, is there any worry about like vibration and temperature when it's living in there yeah so the vibration i think has mostly been resolved by the soldering mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem to jiggle itself too badly once i've done that um if i needed something more solid i would probably consider replacing the wires that go into the raspberry pi headers with more of a like ribbon cable because that's mm -hmm. going to be more mechanically secure overall the soldering seems to be sufficient for the vibration concern. And then for the heat concern, it seems like a lot of the heat is in the lower half. And the drum itself is insulated. So mm -hmm. it's they're mm -hmm. trying not to lose any heat that yeah. they've generated. So they are trying to, at some level. Um, I was kind of worried about dust, actually. So yeah. I'm not oh, sure if that's going to be a problem. Right. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, this has been going for, I, I guess, like half a year. And... So far, pretty good, um, but I will keep an eye on it. Um, but I wanted it to look a little bit more stealthy and not like a bunch of stuff hanging out that could either short or get tripped on or yeah. get ripped apart. So right now, it's uh, it's pretty sealed up and, and nice looking. And it's all inside there. So the uh, I can show... This is the repository for the dryer stuff. Um, I think we went over this pretty much all, all over here. Um, this is just how to install the, the different hardware you need, installing .NET on Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's the PageDuty stuff. This is what kind of dryer I'm using. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're all different. Uh, there's a note about the bulbs. This is the parts list. So um, if you want to build something similar and want to know what parts I used, some other people's projects, I was a little dissatisfied with how specific they were about their bill of materials. Mm -hmm. I tried to make something very specific. And if you want to, you can even go to my DigiKey cart and look at the models that I built. Um, this doesn't always load very quickly, but this is, I'll come back to that. Uh, this is exactly what I bought. So you can look at that and... Uh, Oh, that's handy, buy, yeah. Buy the same stuff if you want to, mm -hmm. including the quantities so that's in there and why I chose these different, or what their purpose is in the, in the circuit. Mm -hmm. um, this is the circuit diagram. So we can, I just did this in Fritzing so you can see what the different connections are, like which pins are you using? And like, cause I think I initially connected the wrong SPI pin cause I didn't really realize how that was supposed to work. And I was getting no data. And I went back to Microsoft documentation and said, okay, how did they connect their SPI pins? And I realized, oh, I did it in the wrong place because I kind of foolishly assumed I've only ever used GPIO. There's a lot more flexibility on GPIO than SPI because there are more of them. So I just thought I could pick any of these. It turns out, no, you cannot pick any of them. There are only like two of these things. You have to use the right one because not every pin works with that. So yeah. I learned that and went back. And so now this is all correct. Um, and you can see the where the different resistors and capacitors and everything are. Um, that's the paper diagram. This is just the steps of going through the opening it up and everything yeah. we talked about. Uh, this is the software side of it, just installing my program. You have to turn on a kernel module, download some stuff, chmod it, install it as a service, and then run it. 
Um, nothing really super crazy here. The one confusing thing here was that the example for how to make a system D service neglected to the one the example I found at least neglected to describe how to set the working directory for your process. Mine needs that oh, because there's okay. a there's a config file. I'm putting the config file in the installation directory, which is the where the executable is. Um, you could also, I guess, put it in like Etsy if you really wanted to be like very complete about it. But um, wherever it is, the um, the process will only look for it in the working directory unless you override it. So if your working directory is like slash, which it is if you just run a systemd service, you're not going to have your config file in slash. So it's going to not find any configs and then not log anything because the logging config was in that config file that it couldn't right. log to. No so idea. it looks like your program just freezes. And what it's really trying to do is show you an error message that you didn't supply some required value, but it can't do that because the logging config is also gone. So that took a really long time to figure out. And I was very frustrated by it when I figured out that it was just the fact that the working directory was wrong. Because it would work if you run it from the command line. Oh, of course. Not right. If, yeah. Not if you run it from system D. So I was mm -hmm. all set to blame system D for this. Oh, you can blame um, system D. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> that's garbage. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. But I eventually figured out, okay, it's probably, I checked all my environment variables, all my yeah, everything. Um, what I should have done was pass stuff on the command line. Anyway, I eventually it dawned on me that this looks like times this has been a working directory problem. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, how do I, can I even set that in a system D unit? I eventually found out how to do that and added that to my my thing. Um, and then in, in a later project, I even figured out how to make the program itself more flexible in terms of where it looks for that. Um, it's a JSON file. It requires more work um, on the on like the app developer's side because the uh, the defaults that are used by um, by the framework tools are don't cover all those cases, but. Um, I eventually got that working. So that's now part of the file that's checked in here that you would download a file that has the fix for that with the working directory. Mm -hmm. So that's in there. Install the service, the config. So same stuff for PagerDuty, uh, nothing special there. Um, and then these are just the configs for this application. So this is the PagerDuty key. This is uh, how many amps does it take for the motor to be considered running? Uh, I saw that mine was 4.33, so yeah. I kind of chopped that in half and made it two. It, you'll need to measure this yourself with your own clamp sensor for your own dryer. Um, same thing for how many milliamps does the light use. Um, these are my fudge factors to make the numbers look more correct after all my questionable math. Um, and then there's some logging levels. So it's really just getting these amp levels. The hardware is really the, the yeah. more challenging part for yeah, this definitely. one. Um, and then you can start the service. You can see that it started with the status. You can look at the logs for the service. And then the same stuff as before where we send a change event to PagerDuty when the uh, dryer starts moving. And then uh, when it stops moving, it finishes it. This is actually really fast because um, unlike the washing machine, which is on a 15 second cycle, this thing's pulling at like 120 hertz for, oh, wow. okay. for AC, for, for the 60 hertz AC. Mm -hmm. and it's only using a one second averaging window. So it's checking effectively every one second. So you can actually hear the, if you're listening for it, you can hear the buzzer go off in the in the garage and then your phone will vibrate with the page duty alert, like right then. And if you're looking at, if you're like looking at your phone's screen at the time, because you've got it unlocked and you're doing something on it, you will see the, the status bar notification. Or if you're using, I guess like SMS or something, or depending on how fast your email is. Yeah. Um, you will see it happen like right then, um, and if you if you're looking at the um, web page or something, and you open the door, it will also uh, resolve it right then. It's very very fast. That's to slick, machines. yeah. That was pretty. It was pretty neat. I didn't know how fast PagerDuty was because, I mean, I've used PagerDuty for work before, and it's always for just like you know, server monitoring. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't the person who configured it. I was just on the receiving end of the alerts. I was not on the ops team who was like doing all the instrumentation and like the Nagios stuff and, and Datadog and all that stuff. So I never really would know how fast it was. And whenever we had like dumb spurious notifications, it was always because our ops people misconfigured something where they've got some ridiculous Perl script that can't tell the difference between like zero and null. So it throws all these page duty alerts and we can't convince them to fix it. And it's not my fault. It's not the server's fault. It's not page duty's fault. It's just the script that thinks that if there are zero connections, 
to a server, it's like a problem where in fact it's not a problem because we just failed over. We did a rolling restart of a cluster and we failed away from everything. So the last server that comes up necessarily is going to have zero connections. No one knows. Like, yes, absolutely. So like, but I mean, that might be null and, and that might be a problem. So time to throw an alert and like page peep everybody. So that was always a huge source of frustration at, at my previous place of work. But um, so I guess my my frustration level at things that PagerDuty tells me about has gone down because it's no longer nonsense like that, where it's just like, your database flush time is too high. No, it's not. Or your <laughs> connection count is too low. No, it's not. And I wish people would fix these, but you know, now it's all configured by me and it's for something that is at least kind of like not awful when it happens. Cause I mean, I started the laundry. Yeah. Right. That's super helpful. Like the man, like, yeah. When I read through this, I was like, this is wow. Like there's just so much stuff going on in here. Like, taking out like the page library, the events library for .NET, like that is its own undertaking. But then the rest of the stuff that you did here, like, I mean, you got a career in IOT out of you? Like what, yeah. what are you hoping to, to turn this into? Maybe, uh, it was definitely a learning experience because as I said, I'm, I'm just a software engineer. I'm really not an electrical engineer at all. So this was a big learning experience for me. I really wanted to find something that I could get better at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of this was copying what other people have done, but a lot of this was unknown territory for me. And just going through and like, now I know what a voltage divider is. I didn't know what that was before. So just trying to pick a bunch of stuff that, you know, a lot of stuff at this particular point in my career, it's more of a comfort zone where I've been doing a lot of the same stuff for like 14 years and I'm getting pretty good at the stuff that I do a lot. So that's just all in a comfort zone. And yeah, I can make an application server. Yeah, I can document its API. Yeah, I can make a client on the web or a backend process or Android or whatever. Like I can do all that and that's not really like a new challenge really. So it's all just yet another API server basically. But yeah, I wanted to find something where it's like, I don't know how to do this. I need to learn how to do this. I need to find something that I'm bad at, which, you know, initially was making an API server. I was initially bad at that. And that, that like need to learn it was what got me so far, but I really wanted to find something that I was not exposed to because I always was really impressed by different like electrical engineering projects. I saw other people doing yeah. I didn't know how to do them, but they were so cool. They're able to do things I couldn't do. They're able to tap into a world that I didn't really have any power in. I didn't know how to like measure any of this stuff or control any of this stuff, or even like reason about what a circuit should look like for any of this stuff. I don't really know what the building blocks are, but finding something where I can get a self-contained problem. If it's something I care about, then I can really just power through and figure out whatever I need to figure out because I'm just, I just made this laundry thing my mission where I don't really care what it takes. I'm just going to figure it out eventually. If I lean on it hard enough and if I lean on it long enough and if I get enough help from other people who are smarter than me, who have done this before and who can I, I can ask questions of people who have more background in this sort of thing, um, maybe more education or more training in this sort of thing and just look some more stuff up online. Um, I want to like get out of that software engineer only bubble, I guess and do something that's cross domain, I guess was, was the thing. And the page duty thing was just kind of a, a fun cherry on the top there because initially I was considering, I think the first idea was just smart outlet, no dryer, and just a, a an SMS provider. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would just pay them, you know, every month or whatever, and they would send SMS messages to my phone. And I was like, okay, that's a minimum viable thing. That would work. That would do what I want. But um, when I was talking about this, I had uh, two roommates at the time, and I was asking, okay, so would this idea even be useful to you, or would this be annoying? And I said, yeah, that'd be really cool. And I asked, what kind of mode of uh, messaging would you want to receive for this? And because at that point, I was thinking SMS. Like, they're, they're going to be fine with SMS. I'll just use one of those providers, those, uh, those people. And I'll just send that with one of their API clients. And between the three of us, I got three different answers, which was email, SMS, and native app, uh, like a mobile app. 
And I said, okay, I mean, I, I could do all that myself. I mean, I know how to send emails programmatically. I could probably get the SMS stuff working with one of the off the shelf providers. And I have written an Android app that supports like Google Cloud messaging mm. before. I have not done that for iOS. I'm not really an iOS developer. And I know how annoying that is to do because I've, I've done it before. Yeah. And I, I don't really enjoy that a whole lot. I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Android development. I like Android to use it, but I'm a little over developing for it, I guess. So I said, okay, well, at some point it just dawned on me, what do I know of that can send messages to three Emails. different yes. endpoints? Yeah. All that stuff. The only thing I knew about at the time, or the only the thing that occurred to me after like a day of thinking about it was PagerDuty can do that because you can set all sorts of different communications. You can have more than one email address. You can have more than one phone number. Yep. Um, they already have an Android app. They already have an iOS app. I know it works because I get all of these spurious notifications from my ops team. And you know, I, I'd used the app before I knew what it looked like and I knew that it worked. And I knew that they had the second really important part, not just the multi um, transport messaging thing was the statefulness of the notifications. Because yeah. what a lot of people say when I talk about this is, well, why don't, like, why would an SMS thing be that much worse if you prefer SMS or like email? And the big thing that I want to explain to people is the fact that PagerDuty is stateful, it remembers whether or not an alert has been resolved. And that's the key thing for me because that ties back to me setting a timer and then like dismissing it and forgetting yes. about it. Because once you've dismissed a timer, there's no going back. It's stateless. It doesn't know that I forgot to actually go to the laundry machine once I've dismissed that timer. It's yeah. gone. So with PagerDuty, I can I can say, this thing needs to notify me and keep notifying me statefully until something in the world changes to resolve that. It's not fire and forget because everything else is just going to be fire and forget where if I make one mistake, if I misclick once or if I do something and then like, oh, I'm like, I'm cooking something or I'm like playing a game or watching something and I'm just like not able to focus on that. That might just go into a black hole and I, I'm not going to remember. And now it's an hour later and I'm just back where I started. But with PagerDuty, I can just have that stateful uh, system where it knows that this event is still ongoing. And that was the really big thing that yeah. I liked, that really elevated it from like, a glorified notification to a real like monitoring system that keeps track of that. So that ended up being really helpful. And uh, I proposed that to my roommates. They had also used PagerDuty previously, so they knew what it was and they're both on board with that. And so that's, that's what we ended up using. Awesome. Th this has been amazing. This has been such a, a great walkthrough of, of this project and like your whole journey through all this discovery of all these different components it's been absolutely fascinating so thank you so so much for taking the yeah, time to so come much. on the channel and share it with all of us so this is absolutely fabulous a ton it. of fun oh my gosh i'm i'm kind of jealous because like i know the smart plugs that i have in my house cannot do any of this so i'm like ah i have to find some different ones maybe so get some casa ones do some fun stuff there so all right. Well, dude, thank you so much. Thank you all out there who've been watching along and, and asking some great questions and, and leaving some uh, comments in the chat there. Appreciate that. And um, yeah, we could, uh, we'll link this and um, we'll have this up on our YouTube channel for, for folks to reference back to. If you have questions, I've posted the links to all of Ben's repositories in the chat. So you have that there as well. Um, he's uh, GitHub slash Alda Viva for, for folks there. Uh, and all his projects are linked in there and all this good stuff. So you can download all the, the stuff that he's been working on. And, uh, and yeah, this is, this has been great. Ben, thank you so, so much for, for joining us today. I and my pleasure. had so much fun listening to you, like go through your thought process here. This is great. Yeah. It was, it was an exciting project to do and also really exciting to share with people. So I love coming on here and uh, talking about that with you. Awesome. So when you think about what your next project is, you know, if you use PageDuty, let us know. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that too. So awesome. Yes. Thank you. All right. For everybody else out there, like we said, we'll be back Monday. Dormain will be back on with the Unplanned Show. Jose Antonio will be back on Wednesday with Terraform Time. And I will see you again next Friday on the How to Happy Hour. In the meantime, I will wish all of you an uneventful weekend. And uh, I hope it's great. So thanks a lot. Thank you.